You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 16. This week is the second and last part of our check-in with the navies in 1914. Today we will be learning about three influential people when it came to the British and German navies, and then we will take a look at the piece of the strategic plan of both nations, with the British blockade of Germany and the German U-boat campaign in the Atlantic. We will then cover the major naval actions that occurred during the 1914 calendar year, before having a more general discussion about what role people thought navies would play in the war in contrast to the role that they actually ended up playing. As I said, this is the last part of the duo of episodes about the navies of 1914, and we probably won't be back to discuss more naval action until we dive headfirst into the Gallipoli campaign early next year. One thing I would like everybody to keep in mind, because I think it does a really good job of giving the root cause for a lot of the actions of the navies in 1914, comes from the excellent book Catastrophe 1914, Europe Goes to War, by Max Hastings. It references the great ghost of the Royal Navy in 1914, Horatio Nelson, whose shadow reached out to them from a century in the past to place upon the sailors and ships of 1914 expectations that were very hard to meet. The reason for the lack of the large battles can be summed up by this quote. In Nelson's time, it was an extraordinary occurrence for a line of battleship to fall victim to any save the vessel of comparable size. In 1914, by contrast, while dreadnoughts remained impregnable to smaller ships' guns, they were highly vulnerable to mines and torpedoes, the latter enabling small warships to yield immense destructive power, in a fashion that seemed monstrously unfair to the schoolboy minds of some sailors. In our tour of three influential personalities, we will start with First Sea Lord Jackie Fisher of Britain. Fisher had begun his career in the Royal Navy in 1854 as a midshipman, and in over the next five decades slowly rose to the ranks of the Navy, becoming commander in 1869, captain in 1876, admiral in 1890, second sea lord in 1902, and finally first sea lord in 1904. It was quite the career. For those unfamiliar with the terminology, the first sea lord is very similar to the army chief of staff position. They are the highest ranking person in the Navy, the top of the food chain. Fisher was an advocate for naval modernization, and he pushed strongly for it during his time as First Sea Lord. He saw the benefit of choosing quality over quantity, and because of this he would take 150 ships out of service soon after becoming First Sea Lord. This allowed the naval budget to decline while increasing the number of new modern ships that were available. Under his leadership, the Dreadnought was created in 1906, with all of the technological advances that we discussed in the last episode, and it was also during his time that the idea of battlecruisers came to the forefront. We haven't discussed battlecruisers yet, 
but they were battle ships that had most of their defensive armor removed, so they were lighter and faster. There were certainly some drawbacks there, but at the time lighter and faster seemed like a really good idea. In 1909, Fisher would become Baron Fisher, and he would use the motto, and just think about this after I say it, Fear God and Dread Not. Get it? Dread not? As in don't dread, but also dread not? It's great, right? I love it. Anyway. Fisher would then retire in 1911, only to be recalled when the war started at the age of 74. We will be meeting Fisher again next year, when we start really throwing around the words like the Dardanelles and Gallipoli. Our second character for today is quite the character, Winston Churchill. While an entire podcast could be dedicated to Churchill's career up to 1914, what we are mostly concerned with is the fact that in 1911 he became First Lord of the Admiralty. This is a political title that made him the leader of the Board of the Lords Commissioners, sometimes called the Sea Lords. When he came into the position, he favored Fisher's policy of modernization and wanted to take it a step further by converting ships to use oil instead of coal. This did start happening before the war began. I don't necessarily want to go too much into Churchill's actions during this episode, because we will be discussing them a lot during the Gallipoli campaign. In my mind, the British naval war takes three distinct phases. The war before Gallipoli, from Gallipoli to Jutland, and from Jutland to the end of the war. Churchill and Fisher will play decisive roles in the first two phases, and when we get to phase two, we will spend probably far too long looking at the political maneuvering that would result in the campaign, its failure, and the resignation of both Churchill and Fisher soon after. But enough about those pesky Brits. Let's move over to the German side and talk about Admiral Tirpitz. Tirpitz was the leader of the German Navy from 1897 to 1916. He was the father of the modern German Navy by taking it from a tiny force to the second largest navy in the world. He was just a cadet in 1865, and would rise through the ranks much like Fischer had. He would eventually be put in command of torpedo development for the German Navy, a station that at the time was right at the bleeding edge of technology. In 1890, he would become Chief of Staff of the Baltic Squadron of the Navy, and it is around this time that he starts having influence over naval decisions as a whole, gaining in the ear of the Kaiser, particularly with his belief that the German Navy needed a large force of modern battleships. Soon after the Kaiser found out about Tirpitz's views, he was moved to Berlin to work on national naval strategy. Tirpitz would become State Secretary of the Imperial Naval Office in 1897, and instantly began politicking for a bill that would give the Navy a massive funding boost. Up to this point, the Navy had been getting piecemeal yearly budgets that could change drastically from year to year. In his proposed bill, Tirpitz wanted a guaranteed yearly allotment. Tirpitz really knew how to play the politics game, and he got $58 million a year in funding over eight years. This was quite the victory for the German Navy, and three years later, Tirpitz would follow it up with a request for more funding, funding that would allow him to double the number of ships. It is also in this second bill that Tirpitz outlines what is known as the Tirpitz Risk Theory. In this theory, he stated that Germany didn't have to have the largest navy, just one big enough that if Britain wanted to destroy it, the Germans could cause enough harm to cripple the Royal Navy and keep them from meeting all of their commitments around the world. To this end, he sought a 2 to 3 German to British Navy ratio, and that we talked about last episode. During the war, Tirpitz played a strictly administrative role, although he would play a role later on when Germany started their campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare. Life aboard ships in 1914 was a study in contrasts, between the types of ships and the positioning of the sailors on the ships themselves. I thought I would throw this bit of information in so that you can have something of a picture of what life was like during the battles that we will be talking about later. One thing sailors almost always had was plenty of food. They often ate better, especially later in the war, than the civilians back home. On the larger British ships, the number of eggs that were fixed for the men in the mornings numbered in the thousands, 
The first big difference aboard the ships was between the newer ships with the oil-fired boilers and the older ships that were light on coal. The oil was far easier to interact with and far cleaner burning. By contrast, the coal ships had to have men shoveling coal into the boilers to keep the ship moving, which was a very hot and nasty job, but somebody had to do it. Another split was the difference between the large ships and the small ships. The officers on the large ships saw their role as more prestigious, which for the most part they were throughout the war. The smaller ships were considered a lesser posting, and were therefore treated as such in the social microcosm of the navy. Aboard the ships, there was also a delineation between the different areas of work on the ship. The posting with the most amenities was as high on the ship as possible. These men spent their days in the fresh air on the tower or on the deck, which while it could be freezing due to the spray, was still better than the alternatives. The first alternative was working the guns. This was hot and sweaty work while in action, but was still at a point in the ship where fresh air was plentiful and the heating and cooling systems were at least sort of likely to work at least most of the time. Finally, at the bottom of the ship was the worst spot to be down in the engine rooms where it was hot and stuffy, especially on the coal-fired ships. These men furthest down in the ship were also far more likely to die in the event of a ship striking a mine, being hit by a torpedo, or really just being in any action of any kind. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean Spiced Tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash gw50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. As I mentioned last week, the main British fleet was called the Grand Fleet, and it was based in Scapa Flow in the Orkney Islands. The British planned to use this fleet to blockade the German fleet to prevent it from escaping the North Sea into the Atlantic, and to keep merchant shipments from reaching Germany from the outside world. There were two kinds of blockades. A close blockade, where you keep the enemy fleet very closely tied up in their port, and a distant blockade, where you let the enemy travel around a small area, but you try to make sure that they stay within this designated small area. The British chose the second of these options for their blockade of the German high seas fleet. This was one of the reasons that the British blockade wasn't the most effective early in the war. It can be difficult to coordinate patrols over distances we are talking about here, which were hundreds of miles of open ocean. Another problem for the British was the fact that they were signatories of the 1856 Declaration of Paris and the 1909 Declaration of London, which put some limitations on how pervasive the British search and seizure activities could be while blockading the ports. This forced the British to allow a lot of ships through, where later in the war the shipments were stopped. The Royal Navy was also hamstrung by the fact that Britain as a nation was so pervasive in merchant shipping at the time. 
This meant that earlier in the war, there were instances of British-financed shipments being sent from foreign countries on British-owned ships to Germany. In essence, some British businesses were giving Germany war supplies. All of these difficulties isn't to say that the British blockade early in the war wasn't effective. There was an almost instant economic effect, like the shortage of horses and other draft animals, that Germany was suffering fairly early in the war. At this stage, horses were very important for agricultural practices, but also very useful for armies. The attrition rate for the animals was pretty high at the front, so while Britain and France could purchase animals from overseas, the Germans were stuck with the problem of having to rob more horses from the economy. The British really wouldn't sort out their blockade until 1917, and after that point, it became very efficient when it came to stopping shipments of any kind from entering Germany. For the first year of the war, the primary result of the British blockade was to keep the German fleet stuck in the North Sea. The German navy wouldn't come out to fight, because the British were the superior force, and the British couldn't attack due to the huge dangers of attacking a fleet in a protected port. This comes back to that fleet in being concept that we talked about last week. The Germans had a fleet, and they really wanted to keep it. This lack of large-scale action resulted in a lot of bored sailors. In his book, Catastrophe 1914, Max Hastings has a few quotes from German sailors at around this time that I thought I would just go ahead and quote, since they do a fine job of encapsulating the boredom experienced by sailors at this time. Seaman Richard Stumpf says, Boredom feeds depression. Everywhere people express disgruntlement at our inactivity. While Reinhold Knobloch says, Morale slides because we thought this war would be something different. Nothing is going on. A tremendous carelessness and boredom prevails on board. The men of the army are envied. There were still actions that occurred that involved small pieces of the larger fleets, but it wouldn't be until 1916 that a large confrontation would take place. We will talk about a few of the early confrontations now. The first naval action that we will talk about today was the confrontation at Heligoland Bight that happened in the third week of August 1914. The battle plan was conceived by two British men, Commodore Roger Keyes and Commodore Reginald Tyrwhitt. The goal of the operation was to lure a small piece of the German fleet out of harbor at a time of day when the tide was at its lowest so that the biggest German ships would not be able to leave port. Then the British would ambush the small German force hopefully dealing with the ships quickly, before the tide rose again, unleashing the German dreadnoughts. The two British Commodores appealed directly to Churchill, who, of course, loved the plan from the instant he heard about it. The British would use three submarines as the bait, and there would be about 50 British ships waiting for the Germans. All of the British ships were smaller ships, just destroyers and cruisers, so they could not stand up to the German dreadnoughts should they appear. The commander of the Grand Fleet, Admiral Jellicoe, apparently didn't even know about the plan that was happening until the day that it began, on August 26th. When he found out what was going to happen, he immediately wanted to sortie the entire British fleet. Jellicoe was very concerned that any British action that did not involve the entire fleet would result in losses that would reduce the British advantage. This large sortie was vetoed by his commanders, but he was able to convince them to send out some of the battle cruisers that were available. These battle cruisers were put under the command of Vice Admiral Sir David Beatty, who was known for his skill and his bold, decisive actions. He was only 43 at the time. I have been saying the age of many of the commanders throughout this entire series, just so I can point out men like Beatty who were far younger than most men of their rank. This quick promotion is the greatest indicator of his skill, or maybe just luck, up to this point in his career. The ships stationed at Helgoland Bight didn't know that these battle cruisers would be coming to their aid. The British wireless signaling system was not very advanced, which made it difficult to communicate over large distances. Early on the 27th, the battle really got going when the submarines surfaced near German forces and were spotted before they started running away. Just as the British planned, the low tide kept the large German ships in port, but some light cruisers and destroyers were sent in pursuit of the submarines. The fighting between ships would begin around 8 a.m., with the area of the battle covered in a thick mist. The destroyers of both navies spent some time firing each other, 
but when the arrival of the German cruisers, the British destroyers retreated further back to their own cruisers. The cruisers then engaged each other that resulted in damage to both sides. Arthusila, the British flagship, was badly damaged before being able, with her last serviceable gun, to get a lucky hit on a German cruiser that put it out of action. While this was occurring, the destroyers were still engaging each other, with the result being that another German destroyer was sunk. The British destroyers were attempting to rescue some of the men stranded in the ocean when more German cruisers arrived, resulting in the British leaving any survivors to get away from the advancing Germans. In an event typical of the early months of the war, a British submarine rescued a few more survivors before leaving the rest with water, biscuits, a compass, and directions to the nearest land. This was quite neighborly of them. Around this time, some cruisers from Beatty's force, now these are not the battle cruisers that were still a few hours away, just normal, smaller cruisers, began to arrive on the scene. The first British cruiser to be seen through the mist caused quite a stir amongst the Royal Navy sailors, before it was identified as friendly. When Tyrwhitt found out that Beatty was on his way, he sent the following message, and I quote, Am attacked by large cruisers. Respectfully request that I may be supported. Am hard pressed. Upon receipt of this message, Beatty put his five battle cruisers on course for Tyrwhitt at maximum cruising speed. While the battle cruisers were steaming to the rescue, the German cruiser Mainz arrived on the scene and just began wrecking house. It was only turned away when a group of several British cruisers were dispatched to stop the mains from having its way with some British destroyers. The mains tried to turn and run, but was caught by the British and taken out. I'm sure you've noticed a pattern already, so you can probably guess what happened next. Eight more German light cruisers arrived and attacked the British cruisers that had just put the mains out of action. Thankfully for the British, it is right about this time that Beatty arrived with his larger ships and they moved as quickly as possible to engage. For an hour they fired at the German ships before realizing that time may be about up for the operation. The tide was slowly rising, and soon the German dreadnoughts would be able to join the battle. With this fact in mind, the British rounded up their ships and retreated from the area. It was only an hour after the British were gone that the German battleships appeared on the scene. In total, the Germans lost three light cruisers and one destroyer while the British had one light cruiser and three destroyers damaged, but all ships were able to make it back to port. It was a British victory, and back home it was celebrated as such. This came at a really important time for the British. With their armies in full retreat after the Battle of Mons, news of a naval victory had a positive effect on morale on the home front. On the other side, the German defeat, in terms of material, wasn't catastrophic. A few small ships wasn't going to break the navy. After the battle, Beatty would write about the Germans who he had faced. Poor devils. They fought their ships like men, and went down with colors flying, like seamen against overwhelming odds. Whatever their faults, they are gallant. The problem with the Germans was that this action reinforced the belief that the Royal Navy was superior to the Germans. This damaging of the psyche would result in the Germans being even more cautious than they had been up to this point. After Heligoland Bight, there were two raids on the British countryside by the German Navy, at Yarmouth and Scarborough. Yarmouth occurred in October, and was a small engagement with just a few ships. The German ships shelled the town of Yarmouth for a bit, and then went back the way they had come from a fear of the British response. The ability for the German Navy to get in close to the British shore and execute the raid successfully was very encouraging to the commanders of the High Seas Fleet, leading almost directly to the raid in December of Scarborough. This was a far larger operation, with the German battle cruiser squadron forming the core of the raid, with the normal cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers. The German high seas fleet even came out of port and moved to the east of Dogger Bank to provide assistance if needed. To face this raid, the British sent a sizable force that included six dreadnoughts. While the raid was occurring, the German battle cruisers and destroyers would be engaged by the British but they were able to fire several rounds into the British towns, which resulted in several hundred casualties. The British force, once again under the command of Beatty, arrived in all of its strength soon afterwards, and gave pursuit of the retreating Germans. Unknown to Beatty, he was rapidly approaching the full force of the German high seas fleet, which drastically outnumbered his own small force. Thankfully for Beatty, the Germans decided to retreat 
because they believed that Beatty's force was just the vanguard of the entire Grand Fleet. If the Germans would have attacked, there almost certainly would have been some significant losses on the side of the Royal Navy that would have went a long way to evening out the numbers of ships on both sides. Even with this chance missed, Germans had still won a propaganda victory. Once again, they had been able to fire shells on the British countryside and get out with very few losses. This raid also caused the British to strongly criticize the Navy. The Royal Navy was the largest in the world. Millions of pounds had been spent on the ships. But somehow the Germans were able to attack twice and pay very little for the privilege. Overall in 1914, the actions of the German and British navies can probably be considered a bit anticlimactic. These were the largest navies in the world, facing off in their home waters, and yet there hadn't been a decisive action on either side. Both sides had spent a ton of money on their navies, and yet the war at sea was no closer to being won or lost on either side after five months of fighting. On land, the armies were throwing haymakers at each other, but at sea they were just jabbing back and forth a bit. This inaction by the two largest fleets would be an influence on the decisions made in 1915 by the navies. To once again go back to Catastrophe 1914, quote, For both sides, deterrence and defense, preservation of assets and being, became the dominant theme of the next four years, at the expense of offensive action. Now I think that is all for our high seas action for now. Next week we will travel back to good old land warfare of northeastern France and western Belgium. The race to the sea ends at a town that would be etched into the British collective consciousness for generations. Goodbye, Piccadilly. Well, let us swear, it's a long, long way to Tipperary.